see a group like this, I think about Gail McGovern. Oh. Yeah. 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 I remember Gail and her feistiness, and never say die attitude. And think of friends in Ellenville and our parents center in Ellenville who were trying to do community organizing in a different way. Those of you who don't know about the Empowering Center should find out about it. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. Uh, we're not used to meetings as much as we once were. Uh, we're online. We're electronically, but not humanly, connected, in my view. And there's an attribute of being with each other, seeing each other, listening to each other, that we kind of replicate tonight. Um, I'll speak about Ishmael's case in a minute, but let me tell you a little bit about why I'm here. Um, like many of you in the audience, we're not that diverse. Uh, we come from a, a time in our country where as young people, we had a certain set of values that we wanted to actualize in this world. And many of us are remain inspired by that set of values which involve race, involve our environment, involve our relationships with other countries and our relationships with each other. And many of us have sort of come full circle from our youth to being in our 50s or 60s or 70s. And we've seen some of what we believe actualized in this world. But we still see the signs of repression, oppression, imperialism, racism, homophobia environmental degradation, and as one of the songsters or comedians said earlier, these are all connected. And the insight which Andy referenced earlier when he spoke is very important. Uh, all of these phenomena that we see are related by one thing, which is consciousness. And the consciousness which allows us to spend $560 billion a year on national defense and allows us to incarcerate almost 3 million Americans and allows us in the Hudson Valley to approve power plants as bridge technologies which use frack natural gas even though we banned it in our own state is the same mentality in my view that prosecutes Ishmael Shabbat. Right. So we have to develop a very thorough going, unapologetic analysis of what power has done in our society, how it misuses and continues to misuse people. When I graduated Harvard Law School, Lloyd Blankfein was in my class. I was in the top 10 in the class, and he was in the last 490. I don't think it's made much difference. He makes about $45 million a year as head of Goldman Sachs. And at our last law school reunion, I kind of confronted my good friend, another Jewish kid from Brooklyn, Mr. Blankfein. And I asked him a few questions about what it is that impels someone to make so much money, run fraudulent schemes on hardworking Americans. And there really are no answers. One of the other distinguished members of my class was standing right nearby, Michael Chertoff. For those of you who don't remember him, he was the knight of darkness in the Bush administration running national security. Starts getting a little closer to Mr. Shabazz's case. Running national security in a way which, as people suggested earlier, trespassed the rights of millions of Americans, particularly those who were uh, from a Muslim mm -hmm. descent or Islamic faith. And I confronted Michael as well, and he too had few answers to justify the policies which he was propagating and perpetrating. So when I see a situation like Ismail's case, what comes to me is everything. It may seem strange to you, but I don't see a single case. I don't see a single person, though I have great respect for what Ishmael has done in this community. I see something emblematic of all of the injustice and all of the misplaced priorities and all of the madness which we have allowed to continue. 
And I say that advisedly and respectively, because in my view, we have allowed it to continue right. in various ways. Right. Yeah. And you know, they say we use five or ten percent of our brain. I translated <laughs> that into something else. I think we use five or ten percent of our energy, the energy which we might expend to promote social justice. And even those of us who are out doing it every day are still not using enough of our energy to do it. And I, I know that's hard to say, but I believe it. And I'll say it. Um, and I say it about myself. I watch too many Yankee games. Um, now, we all need relaxation, and I understand that. But there has to be a more thoroughgoing commitment and an analytic commitment to the issues that we face. So what are the, the discrete and specific issues in this particular case? Well, let me explain it again somewhat conceptually as I understand it. You have an individual who has been known for several decades at least to be an active fighter, hello Evan, an active fighter in his community on several different and kind of conjoining fronts. One is to remove guns from the street. That's been one of Ishmael's objectives. Two is to diminish, as someone before again adverted to, violence between gangs in the community and to diffuse that set of warfare that is destroying so many of our inner cities and those who live there. Try to have different modalities for solving problems. Try to have individuals working together across group lines. Try to have the police appreciate the community and in turn have the community respect the role of the police when rightfully implemented. Yeah. All, of these, all of these were priorities of Ishmael Shabazz in Kingston. Now, none of those priorities involve selling guns to members of the community to do mischief in the community. That was not one of his objectives, and it wasn't one of his means. Quite the contrary. Getting guns off the streets in Kingston was one of his objectives, and it was well known. So that's the person, the man, as he's called here tonight. <laughs> now, let's look for a moment at the government's interests. The government has an interest in rightful law enforcement. I don't think anyone objects to that. Rightful law enforcement. That is, finding out those in any community who are committing mayhem, violence, oppressing poor and minority people often in communities, whoever they may be. That's a significant government interest. I respect that government interest. There may be reasons people are engaging in that behavior. We have to deal with those reasons. There may be alternatives to incarceration. We need to deal with those. But we have to respect that people and communities have a right to be safe, and the government has a legitimate interest in forwarding that right. So we have law enforcement with that alleged interest on the other side. Well, how do they meet? You have someone who's engaging in civil rights activities for 20 and 25 years, who's not engaging in criminal behavior. You have a government that allegedly is interested in stopping criminality and criminal behavior. So in a certain way, you have two unconnected universes. They may connect because Ishmael is conscious that there's police brutality, police misconduct, and that, in fact, discredits the police in the community and makes law enforcement more difficult. Let me give you an example, not from his city, but from Newburgh, where he's working. I did a murder trial in Newburgh about 10 or 12 years ago. A gentleman was walking down the street in Newburgh. It was in the evening, about 11 o'clock at night. There were 45 people on the street. This gentleman pulled out a long arm and shot and killed someone. His defense was that that person was molesting him, harassing him, police were doing nothing, but that's what he did. So we're going to have a trial. I'm defending him. I believe his story. I thought there was self-defense involved. There were 45 people who saw the event. 
The police and the prosecution presented a trial, no witness. No witness. We got to the trial, and I was there with this gentleman, and we were ready to present our self-defense. And the judge said to the people ready to proceed, oh, I need an adjournment. I need an adjournment? He set this date three months ago. Well, we don't have any witnesses. Well, you knew three months ago you didn't have any witnesses, and your situation has not improved, has it? <laughs> no one has. Case dismissed. Now, did that man wrongfully murder the gentleman who was killed? We'll never know. I mean, we may have our own opinions, but we'll never go through a court case. Why not? Because of the level of distrust in the city of Newburgh to law enforcement. Right? Because not one person would come forward and even cooperate with law enforcement seeing a dead body on the ground. Now, that is not a way that, that a civil society can actually function. It is not a way. It's a, uh, it's a really disabled way, if you will. Someone like Ishmael Shabazz then, pointing out, the, because he used the word, corruption of police conduct in Kingston, and he's not just talking. You know what he means by corruption? We have an organized crime unit in the community which morphs into a drug task force. That drug task force is led by men, not women, men, who are supposed to be taking assets, drug assets off the street, and circulating them and recirculating in the war against drugs. What are they really doing? They're taking the money and they're putting it in their own pockets. True? Yep. True? Okay? Now he's pointing that out and saying, how do you have any credibility? How do you have any credibility in law enforcement? What pedestal do you have in the law enforcement community vis-a-vis -vis those who are engaging in criminality? If you yourselves are engaging in criminality, there is no pedestal. There is no credibility. True? What credibility do they have? And, and Andre was speaking about this in his own way a few moments ago. What credibility does a prosecutor have when the prosecutor repeatedly relies upon evidence which he or she knows is false, coerced? None. Now that doesn't just have an effect on that case. That has a systemic effect. What I mean by a systemic effect is it discredits the entire system that we're all part of. And we all have a stake in extirpating it. That means eliminating it. That means having the kinds of sanctions for prosecutors and police officers who engage in that practice, which we do not have, as Ande correctly pointed out. We do not have. So let's go back to Ishmael's situation. He has spent years trying, as Amari Shakur has done in Newburgh, as other brothers have done throughout the Northeast, trying to get the police to be held accountable. That's a critical value. It's a critical value. And guess what? The police are not interested in holding themselves accountable. You hear about these internal affairs units they have in their department. They're a lot like the EEOC, the EEO function in the New York State Department of Corrections. You've been reading the New York Times, the brutality, the disgusting brutality that occurs in our name in the prison system. Mm -hmm. And people come forward, and they complain, and they file complaints, and they're allegedly investigated, and guess what? One in a hundred are vindicated, when probably 95 out of the hundred are indicated. That's the truth. And that's, again, in our name. That's what's important here. This is not going on in someone else's name. This is not a system that someone else controls. This is a system we control and have allowed to persist and continue. And again, it doesn't matter if it's Democrat or Republican or whatever. We have allowed it to continue. So coming back to Ishmael's situation, he's been dramatizing in his own way, as all of us must do bearing witness to what he has seen, and as a community leader and spokesperson, people come to him with stories, right? Yeah. Am I wrong? Yeah. And he becomes a spokesperson for those people who don't have a name in the community and who can't speak for themselves. Odell, does it sound familiar? Absolutely. Because you do the same thing, and I try to do the same thing in Orange County. People come to me because they think that I can get their case in the newspaper. And they want somebody to know desperately what they've gone through. So this
structure of community leadership that Ishmael represents, that Odell represents, that many in this room represent, is critical to social change. Because not everybody has an equal voice. There are people who can publicize and dramatize things where others cannot. And he is one of those people in Kingston, right? right. And because he's one of those people in Kingston, and because there are powers against us who would use all means at their disposal to effectively eliminate and silence him, they predictably did what happened here. If it sounds like an opening statement, I'm practicing. Here's the point, and I want everybody to be very clear about the point. If someone knows that a priority of mine is to get guns off the street, and if someone wants to criminalize me, and they also know that by my possessing the gun, my possessing the gun is a criminal act. I'm not allowed to possess the gun, even if I have a noble purpose. How can I get guns off the street then? You follow me. Yeah. This gentleman over here is a grip. This gentleman over here is a blood. I want both of them to give me their guns to get them both off the street. But by doing that, and for that moment, possessing the gun, the government's argument is he became a criminal, whatever his purpose. Now, a jury may just have to decide that question. Is that really true, regardless of my purpose? So they say to him, we're going to give you some money. You buy the gun, and we get it then off the street. And we're not only, now they have two magnets here. One magnet I told you about. Get the gun off the street. But what's the other magnet they know matters to this new Black Panther? Right? Right. Liberation struggles around the world. The unity of African American peoples, universal unity, international unity, struggles in Africa which continue. So we're not only going to tell him we're getting the guns off the street, we're helping him do that, but we're bringing the guns to Africa. Ah. Now this is not, this is not Ishmael Shabazz's invention. Just remember this. This is not something that he at night is thinking about. I'm going to get the guns off the street and I'm going to ship them to Africa. How many of you know what the word proclivity means? A proclivity is a tendency. A tendency means you have a tendency to do something. This is part of your nature. This is how you function. So we get to a word called entrapment. Entrapment is when the government concocts a scheme, the purpose of the scheme is to criminalize your behavior. And it uses its resources to magnetize you. What does that mean? To drag you in to its plot to see whether you have a proclivity or tendency to do something criminal. Now I want to contrast two situations so everybody understands this clearly. About five or six years ago in Newburgh, there was a mosque. A very dear friend of mine, Saladin Mohammed, had the mosque. He was an important person in the community. He was a very, very good friend of mine. He's in North Carolina now. And he ran the mosque in a very strict way. He knew that post 9-11, mosques were being surveilled. And he was very clear that his mosque was not going to fall under the control of the government. But little did he know that a gentleman in a Mercedes Benz and a very fancy dressed gentleman drove up to the mosque and there were a few people there and he found one and the one he found he was able to convince eventually to engage in a scheme financed by the government, invented by the government, concocted by the government to do some terroristic acts against the synagogue in Riverdale. But listen carefully. Listen carefully. That gentleman recruited three others, and you had the Newburgh Four. And these four people who together probably, we know none of them owned a car, their probably collective monthly income was about $1,000, literally, collectively. 
They became this group that had been recruited at the behest of this Mercedes-Benz driving gentleman, who was a government agent. But what were they going to do? They were going to, they thought, blow up or damage a synagogue in Riverdale. That's a criminal act. That's a terrible act. That's not a joke. That's serious business. And they were willing to do it, according to the evidence that was presented. Could they have done it on their own? We know they couldn't. No way, no way. But they apparently had a, a proclivity or tendency or willingness to do a criminal act. So morally, to me, that's a questionable situation. Let's compare that to Mr. Shabazz. Mr. Shabazz had the following tendency. Get guns off the streets of Kingston. That's the analog to blowing up the synagogue. Does everybody follow? One plot was we're blowing up a synagogue and we're taking other acts. And we're bringing in a stinger missile and we're doing all this crazy stuff. And they allegedly are willing to go along with that. Now, how willing they were, who knows. But they're allegedly willing. The jury found the will. Here's Mr. Shabazz. He's willing. He's desiring. What does he want to do? Get the guns off the streets. <laughs> you follow? There's a big moral difference, in my opinion. A very big moral difference. And there should be a very big legal difference, and a jury should understand what's really going on here. Mr. Shabazz was magnetized by something good. The something good was the telos. The telos means the end. The end was what? Get guns off the streets of Kingston. That could magnetize me. Probably magnetize a lot of you. So what does entrapment mean? Entrapment really comes down to this. Did Mr. Shabazz have a criminal intent which was manifested by years of criminal behavior? Did he have a criminal intent which the government simply provoked, but it was really there all the time and he really wanted to do a lot of bad things? Really? Doesn't sound like it. Now, he may have done some bad things when he was in his 20s, right? Okay, that's fine. That's about 35 years ago. It doesn't really make any darn difference. It's inadmissible in court because it's too remote in time. It can't be used against him. But for the last large number of years that we've all known him, that's not been his modus operandi or what he's about. So entrapment. Entrapment means the government hatches a plan and brings into that plan people who really don't have a criminal proclivity to engage in an act which they want to criminalize. The criminalization is the government. We'll give you a thousand dollars for every gun you get off the street. Great! I want to get these guns off the street. I haven't been able to find employment. Good. That's, that's what we're talking about. That's the structure of this case. That's it. Now, I know that in the newspaper, our county uh, district attorney here, Mr. Carwright, who I've known for a number of years, said that Mr. Shabazz was saying uh, something about killing cops. Now, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I've had my associate, Joshua Pavel, listen to, with, with Mr. Shabazz, a many, many, many recordings. Many, many, many recordings. And guess what? These recordings do not in any manner vindicate the claim that Mr. Shabazz said that. You know who said it? The government confidential informant and Asian provocateur. So what was he trying to do? Now, he knew, he knew he was an agent provocateur. He knew he worked for the government. He knew he was getting paid by the government. And he knew what the government's aim was, which was to frame Mr. Shabazz. So what does he come to the table with? Let's kill the cops. Let's kill the cops or whatever other junk. Now, let me tell you something. They're going to be playing these in court. You're not going to hear Mr. Shabazz say, yeah, let's kill the cops. That was said in his presence. Sure, it was said in his presence by the government agent who's trying to get him to play that because knowing that, that would maybe make Mr. 
Mr. Shabazz seem a little bit less uh, likable to a jury in, in this county and allow the district attorney to go publicly and smear Mr. Shabazz before we even started anything. Because that was the headline, wasn't it? I'm trying to get the guns off the street because I want to kill the cops. <laughs> in other words, this is the level we're dealing with. A level of illogicality and idiocy. Okay, malice. Malice. So, what is the antidote or solution to this? Okay? Well, just like in the Yonkers case where I spent 27 years dealing with racial segregation in that northern city, to me, the answer is doing everything we can to tell the truth and the story. The most important thing we can do is tell a narrative that is clear and is true. If we don't do that, and we let that narrative be defined by Holly Carnwright and the police and others who have their own objective, we are way behind. Way, way behind. So, to me, this is so critical. And I'll spend every night from now to whenever, going wherever you want me to go and try to tell what it is we know about this. Because people need to understand it. And frankly, people in the community that Mr. Shabazz was trying to work with for all these years need to understand it. Because many of them can doubt too. They may not understand what's going on. They may lose faith. They may think he is another leader who had his own agenda and had nothing to do with us. They're wrong. My view, they're wrong. His agenda had everything to do with helping the community. Right. So, so this, is, this is the sort of end of it for me. In each instance, and each example is everything. That's what I've come to realize in this advanced age. When you, look at, when you look at the example of Mr. Shabazz, what you see is everything. You see the, in a way, desperateness of those in power to keep power and to shut up someone who is being effective in their community at telling the truth to power. Right. right. Yeah.
uh, a grievance was mysteriously filed against me with the grievance committee by a gentleman who owed $5,000, paid $500, and claimed that I didn't properly credit his account. Mm. There was a hearing, and it sounded like there was nothing going to happen. And the result of it was I was suspended from the practice of law for a year. Oh. And it was very clear to me what was going on. But all I said publicly was this. I committed a technical violation, and those in power will have to figure out how to deal with it. <laughs> and I started promoting folk music concerts, and I did what I could do. <laughs> now, what, what I'm saying is this. It's discouraging to be in Mr. Shabazz's position, but the person who is centered understands that the oppression visited on him or her is really a compliment. It's really a testament to the threat, and I use that word in quotes, that he poses in his community to those who feel entrenched and who don't want the scrutiny. The best antidote to that is for us, collectively, to amp up that scrutiny Ten times right. in Mr. Shabazz's name. Yes. To use the information we have and can get to dramatize the corruption of those in power in that community, not to back down, and to do it in his name. He's still with us, thankfully. Mm -hmm. In his name. They win. Mm -hmm. If we back down out of fear, they win. I remember when, in 2003, I started practicing law again, and some of the judges who never understood why I was suspended to begin with, and put my cases on suspense dockets, were very polite to me. And I came back, and I was the same as I always was, and they say, didn't this change you? <laughs> I said, yes, it did. It made me much more determined. <laughs> OK?